Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth, first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Sam Ness. Appreciate it. How are we doing this morning? Good. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here, and I get to unpack this passage for you. Here's how I want to start us off, though. Uh, sometimes at the Wad House, we forget to stop and be still before the Lord. So I want to stop. We do this at dinner sometimes and just give each person space to stop and thank God for what's in front of them. We don't have a meal in front of us. We have the Word of God. So if you're a part of our church family, you're a regular attender, I want you to spend some time thanking God for the book of Revelation in your own way. If you're new, new to church, new to Jesus, figuring this thing out, you think this is all weird, just enjoy a little silence <laughs> that you might not get the rest of your week. So let's just take a moment and be silent together. God, thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for speaking to us, not at us. Thank you for being with us, not just around us. And God, thank you for my role as a pastor where I get extended time in your word that is not afforded to everyone else. So thank you for your goodness to me, to us. And as we close out this book, the final chapter in this Bible. God bless us once again by your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's what I know. Everyone comes in here with some sort of notion or idea of heaven, and you have lots of probably questions about heaven. So if you ask just an average person, like, what are the things about heaven, whether you believe in it or not, or you have a really crystal clear picture, or it's sort of vague, like, what are the questions we have about he heaven. Here's the ones I get mostly as a pastor. The number one question I get, maybe it's the demographic that is largely in our church, any idea what it might be, it is, is there going to be sex in heaven? <laughs> to which I think, I don't know, I remember talking with a group of pastors, I'm like, yeah, but Jesus says there's no marriage in heaven, and this guy, creepy pastor, just kind of stared at me, yeah, but I, sex is a good gift, and Maybe he kind of opens up the floodgates, and I'm like, stay away from my wife now and forever, <laughs> you dirty, dirty dog. <laughs> Kirk in the back doing slides says, is there going to be meat in heaven? If there is no more killing, those of us who love red meat, are we ever going to enjoy a hamburger ever again? I don't know. Are our pets going to be there? What's space going to be like? There's lots of questions. And here's just the disappointing reality about Revelation. It doesn't really care to answer a lot of those side questions. Here's what Revelation has been doing from the beginning chapter when we opened it up a few months ago till now. It's giving us images. Image after image after image to shape our imagination as we try to live out this life of faith in this world that is pressing on us to go opposite direction of what God wants us to go in. So it's just here to give us image after image after image. And as we get to Revelation, what I'm teaching today is 21 and 22. We're going to see the end of all things when heaven and earth come together once and for all. And God is finally once and for all at the center of the universe for those of us who love him. 
the city of God written by a famous African theologian, Augustine. He says this just hits the earthly city glorifies in itself. The heavenly city glories in the Lord. Here's what we're about to do. We're about to walk into the heavenly city and glory in the Lord. And we're going to do it with four images and then one final send off from Jesus. Here's our images. We've got a wedding. We've got a city. We've got a temple. And we've got a tree. The book of Revelation is picture after picture after picture. We've got a wedding, we've got a city, we've got a temple, and we've got a tree. So if you've been tracking with us, let's finish out Revelation together. Here we go. The first image we get is a wedding. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Let's read this together. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth in the description given of what John is seeing is like a wedding. Just to make note of what we're not talking about. When most people talk about heaven, what they're talking about is what happens when you die. For Christians, we believe that once you die, you are present with the Lord, but you're not in your current body. You are asleep and your soul goes to be with the Lord. That's not what Revelation 21 is ta- 22 is talking about. Currently what's happening, it's fast forward to the end of all things. When heaven and earth come down, that's the new heavens and the new earth once and for all. That's what we're talking about. And how is it described? New heaven and new earth will pass away. What does that mean? This is unique. Like Eastern religions, there's this like endless cycle until all things kind of absorb into the universe and everything ceases to sort of be individualistic and the universe just is. Western Jewish thought is much more linear. There's a history to this. We are going somewhere. Where are we going? We're going to this point where the new heavens and the new earth exist. How does it happen? The old stuff passes away. How does it pass away? This is a little just theological kind of drill down. There's two options. God looks at the heavens and the earth, and he totally demolishes it, and then he recreates, once again, brand new, new heaven, new earth. And it's just not as in line with what I think Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches, and this is hard to grasp, there's sort of a cleansing, a renewal, a restoration of that which was old to bring in that which is new. Even talking about a Christian, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Behold, you are a new creation. The old is past, the new has come. So God describes me as a new creation. Why well, I still have the same genetic code, same blood type, same everything as before Jesus in my life, but there's something new about me. Similarly, the universe is talked about. In 2 Peter, Peter's in this discussion about the end times. People are kind of debating, like, how's it all going to happen? When's Jesus come back? And he talks about the time of Noah when God redid the earth through water, and he says this about it. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Pause right there. So what happened? Noah, God looks out at the world Noah's living in. He says, every thought in their heart is deceitfully wicked. What am I going to do? He washes the world clean with a flood. Likewise, the second coming of Jesus... And the heavens will pass away with the roar. What we're talking about, Revelation 21, 22. And the heavenly bodies, all created things, will be burned up and dissolved. That sounds like a complete destruction. And the earth that the works that are done on it will be exposed. What I think is happening is the image is now fire sweeping through and not destroying everything, but cleansing and cleaning like you do with gold and refining that which is to bring in the old or bring in the new and leave away the old. Either way, this is not a test you have to pass as you meet Jesus one day to get into heaven and earth. But the reality that Christians believe is the old will pass away and the new will come. And we long for that day. But the main thing I want to get out of this is the image given. Verse 2 is this. What is that moment? What is that day when the roar happens? I saw this, verse 2. The holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. I love weddings maybe more than any human being in the world. I love doing them. I love going to them. I love my own. I only want to have one, but if I could do it again, I'd do it all over with my wife now that we got a little more space and time. I love weddings. And what the Bible says is the thing we're going towards is a wedding. Who's the husband? Who's the groom? I mean, who's the husband? Who's the bride? (laughs) The bride is described as the one coming down from heaven prepared. Jerusalem the new heavens coming down is like the bride being prepared for her husband, the earth that awaits the reunion of all reunions. This is what we're longing for, heaven and earth joining. Once again, it's how the Bible started, heaven and earth created, and what we're waiting for is heaven and earth to come back together one time. Now, I love, like I said, I love, 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 love weddings. I love doing them. I love officiating. There's been a recent trend. I think TikTok is the creator of it. regarding officiants that would be my job in a wedding so I was doing counseling with this one couple I was giving them a few different like lessons here's what I think you guys should think about they listened to none of it they said ah whatever (laughs) so I meet with them one last time any things for the ceremony I need to know I mean it's a tiny wedding it's like 10 people like she's like one thing please what would you like miss bride um could you, like, get out of the way of the picture, you know, once the... <laughs> and some of the older people are like, what? And I was like, you're the third person that's asked me. So that's just common now. I'm like, can you tell me where that came from? And she says, I saw it on a TikTok. The best way to get wedding photos is to ask your officiant to kind of sidestep and get off the stage so that the focus, the husband and wife, can be there. Again, you can be a grumpy old man like me and be like, ah. Here's my point. When people think about heaven heaven and earth coming together, the reason why most of us aren't longing for it with like a deep gut, ah, I can't wait, is our picture of heaven and earth does not have the main attraction in it. It's just the stuff of this world cleaned up and the pain of this world band-aid up as we look ahead. That's not all that appealing. It's this appealing. But what we have here, verse 3, here's what makes this wedding beautiful. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, here's what we long for. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. We are longing for the day. Whether you believe it or not, some of you are Christian, some of you aren't, the longing inside of you is for that verse to be true. That there is a God. He's not distant. He's close. And one day we get to live with him face to face. Relationship in complete intimacy. And that's the thing we are waiting for. And what's he going to do? Verse 4. Maybe the most beautiful sentence you'll read in any book. And it's true. He, that's God, the main actor in this story, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. The wedding, heaven and earth come together, and God is there with us, and he wipes every tear from every eye. Now we can wrestle with like how literal this is. I think it's going to be far better than this sentence could ever do justice. Here's the reality of weddings. We all carry a story into our wedding. Some of you are married, some of you aren't, some of you are divorced, some of you are divorced a few times. Like the unique beauty of marriage is you take these two stories and you integrate them into one story. And the responsibility, I think, on the husband, I heard an old pastor from Texas say, men, young men especially, listen to me. When you're thinking about marriage, here's the reality. You play the cards you're dealt. And it was his Texas crass way to say, you're marrying a girl with her own story up to this point. You don't get to change any of that. You don't get to tweak it. You don't get to point fingers at her. You take her as she is. I think a more beautiful picture is men, husbands, you are stewards of the story of the wife God has given you. You are not the author. You don't hold the pen to her story. 
You're not the editor. You don't get to change it. You get to take that. Like the, gospel, the New Testament talks about my job, a pastor, as a steward of the mystery of the gospel. I, get to, I don't get to make anything up. I got to take this and hold it gently and accurately and passionately and pass it on. Men are supposed to take the stories of their wives and hold them gently and passionately and steward their wife's story. And what we see here is all of us get to experience that one day. We're going to see Jesus face to face, and he's not going to shame us for our story. We're going to walk to him boldly, men and women alike, dirty as can be. And he's going to wipe away every tear from your eye. And death will be no more, nor will there be mourning. The wedding we all long for, the story that we carry. God does not look around or avoid. There's chapters in your story you've told no one that you're going to keep hidden and locked away until you die. And Jesus is going to open it up and you'll be restored completely. That's the gospel. That's the first images. We are waiting for a wedding. But more than just a love story, God is restoring all things. Christianity doesn't teach a bunch of floating, lovey-dovey things. It teaches a restoration of all of creation. Here's the second image we long for, is a city whose builder is God. 21, verse 9 through 21, let's read this. Again, like Revelation, we've, it's a lot of description, a lot of images, but just track with me. Revelation 21, 9, then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Now he's talking about the city. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. Still tracking. And then on the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates, and on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. Now he describes the shape. It's a giant cube. The city lies four square. Its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with its rod, 12,000 stadia. That's about 1,400 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold. That's where we get all the language of golden streets like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopaz, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and each of the gates were made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. That's a lot of description. Just a little history lesson on me. I've taught this passage one other time in my life, and I taught it completely wrong according to my present day self. When I first was feeling called to ministry, I was in Texas. An elder at the church was like, I want you to help me teach Sunday school classes. And I got to teach this exact passage, and I taught it with passion and fury and just And I said, this is what heaven's going to be like. And I described what I just described to you. I said, this is literally going to happen. This cube is going to come down from heaven. 1,308, I described it in Texas language. It's three times the size of Texas. What are you, what you got to do in Texas? But it's huge. Mount Everest is 5.5 miles tall. This has 1,380 miles. So you could fit 300 or 50-ish Mount Everest and then stacked. It's a big city. Is God trying to say, this is exactly one day, the day is coming, and this cube, like a sci-fi movie, is going to come out of, kind of, it's going to be far better. The size is just a way to say, it's big enough to house us all. What about all the language with the walls? 
throughout all the Old Testament, here's what the walls represented for the Jews. They were always, and they still are, watch the news, in the center of all the news. Well, how do you stay safe? Their answer back then was walls. How do you keep your identity secure from getting mixed up and becoming like the other nations? The answer, a wall. So how do you have safety, security, and identity? The biblical answer in the Old Testament is a wall. So now we see the new heaven, new earth joined, and the city comes down with these giant walls. It's just a way to say this. This is the ultimate place of security. The thing inside of you that you long for, it's here and only here. An identity, the place where you want to be totally comfortable in your own skin without any sort of checks and balances and like, I am who I am. Where do you get that? In this city here. And where do you get total identity? In this city with these walls here. And at the center is this glory. It's like this radiance, rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. What's at the center of heaven according to scripture? Not according to modern man. At the center of heaven is human development. At the center of heaven, according to the Bible, is the glory of God that has no end or expiration date. His glory forever, his radiance forever. It never is not satisfying. And Satan, in all that we've read in the book of Revelation, is trying to trick us into thinking that there is something better than the glory of God in our lives, and there is not. The city, the new Jerusalem, one day is going to come down and make all things perfect. One thing I thought about what this tells me as I read about a new city, like one of the political terms these days, at least in America, would be progressive. And it's not often used with Christians. If it is, it's like, oh, you don't want to be. But progressive is this. We are progressing towards something better. And a lot of secular thinkers think Christians want to regress or be conservative, stay in a darker time. But we need to progress. We need to get to somewhere better. Just so you know, The Bible is progressive. We start in a garden. We end in a city. We start with one man, one woman. We end with every tribe, tongue, nation worshiping before the Lord. We end with one job description. Adam and Eve, cultivate the land I've given you. At the end, every nation brings their glory into the center of the city of God. Christianity is as progressive as it comes. It's beautiful. It might not be socially progressive in ways that culture wants it to be, but it is progressing somewhere beautiful. And two things I just want to make sure we know about this city. Like, what's happening? What can we pull from the text here? What are we going to be doing in heaven? Are we going to be cooking red meat? Are we going to be married? Are we going to have pets? Are we going to... Two things, it doesn't answer all our questions, but it gives us some sense of what we long for. There will be complete peace, which is what we all would hope would be the answer. But chapter 22, verse 2, let's read this, where I pull this from. This is a section we'll get to, but it's describing the center there. In verse 2, it says, Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit for each month. These leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The biblical answer to what's wrong with the world is a lot. Specifically, here's what happens. Genesis 1 and 2, everything's perfect. Genesis 3, we rebel. Adam and Eve choose not to listen to God. And four things break. Their relationship with God, broken. Their relationship with the other, broken. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames Adam. They blame their mothers. Like, I don't have a mother. They just start right back and forth. Their relationship with earth is broken. The earth is now cursed. And their relationship with themselves is broken. They're insecure. For the first time ever, God creates this perfect world, and then he goes to find them. Hey, where are you? Where are you? And they were hiding in shame when there was no shame prior. What we read here is the tree of life will be for the healing of the nations. That broken relationship between Adam and Eve that every married couple in here knows about. Adam and Eve, okay, well, let's try this again. Maybe the next generation will do better than us. Let's have sons. All right, Cain and Abel, and Cain kills Abel. Fast forward to any demographic, any ethnicity, any socio-demographic, anything you want to look at across the world, there is fracture and breaking. Palestinians and Jews, Armenians and Turks, Blacks and whites, slaves, slaveholders. Everywhere you look, there's, that's not how that should be. Until you get to the end, 
And there's a city, and at the center of the city is healing for all the nations. The biblical word, the Jewish word, would be shalom, harmony. Most people think of peace, and it's like, just no fighting. I have four kids. Peace means shush. The biblical word for peace would be every kid synchronized together, working perfectly in unity. And one day we're going to be in a city where every nation, every tribe, every tongue confesses with one mouth, he's Lord, and loves one another perfectly. That's the first thing, peace. The second thing would be purpose. Chapter 21, verse 24. What will we be doing in heaven? I don't know fully, but this gives us a taste says this, by its light will the nations walk. That would be the light of God. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And the gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Here's the picture. All the ethnicities, all the cultures, all the family backgrounds that are redeemed by Jesus, spending eternity with him, are going to have work to do. And they're going to bring back to God that which they've done, created, cultivated, and say, here you go, my king, and repeat for eternity. This was the biggest hole in my understanding of heaven. Became a Christian, 18. Heaven was boring at 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. In fact, if someone said, hey, you're going to go to heaven soon, I would be furious. Like, ah, this is better than whatever that is. And I picked up a little book creatively titled Heaven by Randy Alcorn. And it reads just like a textbook. And he basically takes all the misnomers about heaven and helps fill in a theology of heaven that I never had. But the thing at the center that really shaped me was that me, as a person, is going to have stuff to do that is central to me and beneficial and willing and able to give to God as a future and an eternity. For example, I'm a pastor. There's not going to be churches, per se, I think, in heaven. But what do I love about pastoring? I love teaching. I love taking that which seems up here and bringing it here. I love connecting. Oh, you're from here? Oh, you? I love building and cultivating culture. What I read here is there is something in the new heavens and the earth for me to be a part of that fills my soul, that fuels me, and I get to present back to my king. That's what we get to do. Now, you'd be like, I don't know what that is for me. Have I found my sweet spot? Just know, this is for the younger folks, 40 and below. I was like 35-ish when I felt like, I think I figured out what I'm good at. You're like, that is a long time, slow guy. Maybe you're faster than me. So give yourself space, all you 26-year-olds, as you're working a job that kind of fills you up but kind of drains you. But then on the other side of this, know this. Most people that are with Jesus now never got to experience the fullness of their vocational identity here on this earth. Meaning the kingdom of earth and Babylon being in charge does not award us all the opportunity to fully know ourselves and what we were placed here for. But the Christian faith teaches there is a day coming where we all get to enjoy that fully in heaven before our king. Amen? We got a city. Here's the next image. is a temple. We got a wedding we're longing for. We got a city that we will live in with our king forever. And now we have a temple, which is interesting because it's not actually described. Read this with me. Revelation 21. Let's just read verse 22 together. John says this now. And now I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. I'll read 23 together. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Pause right there. All along, if you've been with us, Revelation 3, John looked and he saw, and it's this crazy image. John looked and he saw, Revelation 7. John looked and he saw, John looked and he saw. And he writes down, Revelation 21, John looked, and he describes what he did not See, for the first and only time in the book of Revelation. Meaning he's looking at the city. He's, wow. But he notices there is something missing based off what I think should be there. Just context. John is a Jewish man. 
He was converted to Christianity from Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah of the Jewish faith. What's at the center of the Jewish faith? Yahweh. How do you worship Yahweh? You do it at the temple. Well, why is that the way we do it? Because here's the story of the Bible. Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, together. If you don't know, Genesis 1 and 2, perfect relationship with God until they rebelled and God kicked them out of the garden graciously. Why? Because they would have gone back in and eaten of the tree of life and lived forever in a fallen state. What's he put on the outside of the garden to remind them, do not come back here? Two warrior angels standing there protecting the garden from Adam and Eve ever coming back. You fast forward, what happens next? They create a temple. First it's a tent, a traveling tent as they go through the wilderness, and then they land in the land and Solomon builds a temple. What is that temple? It's this glorious reality where you got this holy place, and then you've got this extra holy place called the Holy of Holies, and who is allowed to go in there? Only one man once a year. Totally covered in the blood of the innocent goats, and he's allowed to go in there for just a moment and experience a bit of the presence of Yahweh that was once freely given in the garden. What is that temple? It was just a temporary holding spot until we get here. Hebrews describes it this way, the temple. This is, you can go and read chapter 8, but it's all about, what's the temple all about? What was all that Moses stuff? Here's all they are. They serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, period. What was the temple for? It was a holding spot. To remind God's people of this. Here's how most people think about religion. Just baseline. What do I have to do to get to heaven? And maybe this book will give me some answers. That's not the question at the basis of this book. The assumption on this, this book here, the Bible, the word of God, is how does a holy God ever live amongst sinful, unholy people? How does my holiness exist here where there is no holiness? And the temple was a holding spot until the final day when we get to see God face to face. Verse 22, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. We have complete and unmediated access to God. How did that happen? Hebrews would say, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Christian, you have access to God now, although it's partial. The New Testament would use the word veiled. You have access to his spirit and to the work of his son. But one day we're going to see him face to face in a city and we will be with him forever. That is what's appealing about heaven. We get God without any restriction. And that takes us to our final image of the book of Revelation. If you've been with us, well done, we made it. To the end, what is going to be the final image God gives us through the Apostle John? Just to track with me, we've had dragons chasing pregnant women. Some of you are like, what? We've had a land beast coming out of the earth. We've had a sea beast coming out of the waters. We've had the mother of all prostitutes riding a beast, kind of puppeting the city of Babylon. We've had this wounded lamb all along the way. And if Revelation is really a book given by God to take our imagination and enlarge it for the sake of God and his glory, what will be the final image he gives us? Interestingly enough, it's a tree from the very beginning of the story. I want to read chapter 22, the first verse together, first two verses. And this is the last image John gives us. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding each, its fruit each month. And the leaves of this tree were for the healing of the nations. If you know the Bible at all or kind of are familiar, this should sound really familiar a place where God is the center, rivers flowing from this place, trees on either side. And now we see it at the center of the city. I was doing research on garden cities and just kind of that dynamic, and it's all over the place. Chicago was built on this premise. They wanted to be a garden city. 
They wrote in there, we never want to have any industrial buildings blocking our view of the water. We want to have green space from the water to where the city starts. We always want to be a garden city. And then an architect came and created a master plan in the early 1900s to keep Chicago a garden city. New York has this beautiful garden in the middle. What is our infatuation with gardens and cities? Is it just have to do with plants and green and contrast? I think it's this. All of us long to go back to a different time. Not like pilgrim time, but like there had to be a time where it was better than this. Where I was not riddled with guilt and fear and shame. Like part of why I think I love Christmas so much is it like takes me back to like an innocent childlike time in my life. I'm like, ah, that's what I want. The Bible says all of us long for that. And the picture we have in the Bible is the Garden of Eden. Here's the bad news. None of us can ever go back. None of us can reverse back even a single second of our life. All the redos you want, all the regret, all the remorse, all the pain, all the sin, all the suffering done to you, all the suffering created by you, Like, every human wants to go back. I just need a redo. And there is no redo offered. But you open up the Bible, and there's this word called grace. And he does not clear it. He renews it. And we get to the end of the story. At the center of the city that I will live in, with a lot of you, for all of eternity, are two trees, the tree of life to remind us of God's never ending grace. No other religion, worldview, offers something as beautiful and as poetic as that. When God first introduced himself to the Jews, here's how he described himself. Now we get to see it in action in Revelation. But here's how God says, I need to be described. I am the Lord, the Lord. I am the God, merciful and gracious slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and keeping steadfast love for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And you get to the end of the story and the last image we're left with is from the garden and the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month, meaning the grace never comes to an end. That is the hope of every Christian in this room. It has nothing to do with our ability to do this well. It's that God as an author is a far better author of my story than I am of my own. That's the final image we're given from the book of Revelation. Now, here's the reality. You still have a lot of questions. I asked my kids last night, what do you think about heaven? Ozzy had a few decent answers. Roman had a few. But all of us have so many. Like, do, is there going to be red meat? Is there marriage and sex? Is my dog going to be there? What about space travel? I don't have any answers to that. What's fascinating, though, Jesus does not want to leave us with sort of up-in-the-cloud questions. Here's Jesus' last thing. He says this. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22, verse 7. Here's Jesus' hope for us, that we would take heart this truth. I am coming soon, and behold, blessed is those who keep the words of the prophecy of this book. How do we keep the prophecy of this book? Some of you walked in for the very first time. Some of you have been here. How do I keep this book? I want to leave us with a few just pastoral thoughts. Here's the first way is keep the images close to your imagination. We did not just walk through dragons and sea beasts and prostitutes and lambs for nothing. The whole book of Revelation has these stark, crazy images, but they're very contrasting. There's no middle ground. Here's what this book, Revelation, gives us. You have one option. You're going to follow something. Here's here's what you're going to follow, the dragon or the lamb who was slain. You will follow the way of the world that is power, more, success, keep going, keep going, or you will follow a lamb. 
an embarrassing sacrifice lamb. Which one will you choose, the dragon or the lamb? One guy after the first service said, that was great, but what does that mean for me? Practically, here's what I would tell you. It's not a problem you're going to solve in your head intellectually, but it's a tension every Christian must live with. Is this job opportunity me chasing the dragon? Is this family interaction a chance for me to go the way of the lamb? Those are your images. Faithfulness is the way of the lamb. That's the first thing. Second thing is this. Keep your faith as simple as possible in a very complicated world. I'll just use the words of this book. Here's how the the faithful ones in the new heavens and the new earth are described. They are described as those who followed the lamb wherever he goes. Like, just think how complicated this world is. All the options, all the tech, all, all the things going through all of our minds at all the time. The Christian, here's our simplify it. Is this where the lamb wants me to go and go? That's it. I'm going to follow the lamb wherever he goes. And then finally, here's what I would just tell you. Keep his gospel at the center. We did not earn God's favor. Christian unique belief. We did not earn a relationship with God. And we did not earn eternity with God. Most religions, most views of the world have this reality. That heaven is a future reality that we are striving for. Reaching for. Hoping for. Working towards. Here's the gospel. Heaven is a current reality that we get to live from. If heaven is the, at its core, God and man together, Christians, we have that. Not based on anything I've done. The finished work of Jesus Christ. If I was part of the garden problem and I should be separated from God, what's the solution? God says the solution is my son Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. If you trust that, if you believe that I'm yours, now you get a little taste of heaven now and the fullest picture when this comes true one day. That is what we have, Christians. A gospel that is not based on our merit, our worth, our goodness, but on Jesus Christ, the perfect one. And I want him to have the final say. So here's what I want to do to end us. I want you to close your eyes. And Revelation 22 is no longer images. It's just John discussing and Jesus preaching. And I want to read the final words of Jesus in the last book of the Bible over us as you close your eyes. Remember, these are the words of our Savior. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David. I am the bright morning star. And surely, I am coming soon. Father, may the images of Revelation and the words of Jesus stick with us long after we've forgotten all these sermons. Keep the images fresh and keep Jesus' words close to our heart that he is coming soon and he will reward us for a life of following the Lamb wherever he goes. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.